In this particular lesson, we're going to be discussing the 19 signs of a close call friendship. And the reason why this is so critically important is because oftentimes this whole issue or topic of friends uh, is so ambiguous. Many couples struggle every single day about what is appropriate and not so appropriate when dealing with members of the opposite sex. So oftentimes these friendships go from being platonic to problematic. And there are warning signs, there are yellow flags, there are all types of things that we typically will sweep under the carpet and not address. Uh, we become very silent and uncomfortable. Uh, and oftentimes we allow these feelings to fester on the inside until we have a volcanic explosion and it results in major conflict because we never addressed it from the beginning. So we're going to use this session to address the issue. Now the reality is many of us may come into the marriage with our own set of friends. And these friendships may go all the way back to childhood. We may have picked up friendships along the way throughout high school and college or uh, possibly at work or within social organizations, church, wherever they come from, friendships is just a part of life. And there's nothing wrong with having a friend. As long as you understand that your marriage is the primary relationship and all other relationships fall secondary to that, you're in the safe zone. The problem occurs when all of a sudden these platonic relationships create vulnerabilities in our existing marriage and now we have issues. So the first sign of a close call friendship is you save topics of conversation only for this friend. Now this presents a major problem because as mentioned, your partner is your primary relationship over all others. And so that should be the relationship where you should be free to share all types of experiences, have all types of topics of conversation uh, with your spouse. But when you are saving conversations, specifically for a member of the opposite sex, it creates a problem. Why? Because intimacy is the foundation of all communication. And if you're able to connect with an opposite friend, opposite sex friend, in the way that you can't with your spouse, there is a problem. You know, there's an awesome concept called the moon to earth syndrome. Now, let me share it with you. If you look up into the sky and look at the moon, you may see different shapes and sizes of the moon. So in essence, you will either see a full moon, a half moon, a crescent moon. But whatever that moon looks like, you're seeing one face of the moon. That in order for you to see the other face of the moon, you would have to travel into space, look down from a different angle to see the other face of the moon. This is what is considered the dark side of the moon. Now, all of us have a dark side. Now, when I say dark, I do not mean wicked or evil or sinister, but when we say dark side, we're really talking about an undiscovered side of who we are. And all of us have an undiscovered side that our spouse has not identified, they haven't recognized, they haven't tapped into. Not because we're necessarily hiding things from our partner or our partner's hiding things from us, but because of the nature of our chemistry, because of our likes, because of our commonalities, there are certain things that just did not come out. And so the problem is when you can connect with someone else who can tap into that dark side that your partner's not privy to, it can create a vulnerability because an interest, a chemistry can develop with that other person. Now remember, if every single relationship is based upon some form of attraction, not necessarily sexual, not necessarily emotional, but there's something that attracts and binds you to that person, and oftentimes it's a commonality that you share, that is where the vulnerability comes in. So if I have a natural connection with someone else, that I don't have with my partner and now we come together and we can dialogue and we can conversate and we can talk based upon that commonality, then now we share something with each other that we don't share with our spouses. That's when we've entered into the danger zone. So if you see yourself doing that or if your partner is doing that with a member of the opposite sex, that's a warning sign that you're crossing over from platonic to problematic. Sign number two, you share spousal difficulties with a friend, which is a form of criticism towards your spouse. This is very problematic because when you share problems that you're having in your relationship, private matters, 
with the public, really what you're doing is you're exposing your partner because certainly the issues that you have are a result of your partner because we typically don't expose ourselves. We don't talk about our own issues. We talk about our partner's issues. And when you do that, what you're doing is you're creating a vulnerability within your relationship. Sign number three, your friend shares his or her relationship difficulties with you. Now this is problematic because if you spent your time complaining about your partner and now your friend spends his or her time complaining about their partner, now you come together in a very different way. Now you share the same problems, the same issues, the same challenges, and there's a level of sympathy and empathy that you have for one another. And oftentimes that is the attraction because you both are going through the same experiences and you begin to show up in ways for your friend that your own partner doesn't show up for you. And so what happens is inappropriate attractions can develop based upon this commonality. Let me share an example with you. I had a friend many, many years ago, and we were literally just friends. Uh, there was no attraction, there was no interest whatsoever. Uh, we were involved in the same type of business, so we saw each other occasionally. Well, she, came, she got to the point where she got into a relationship and decided that she was going to get married. And when she got married, myself along with another were witnesses at her courthouse wedding. And soon after her marriage, she began to experience all types of challenges. So guess who she calls? Obviously, she calls me. Now, at the time, I wasn't a marriage counselor, but I was someone who was dealing with single relationships. So she sought me out for advice. And as I gave her great advice to help enhance and improve her relationship, it actually backfired. Because every time I gave her advice, every time I became a listening ear, every time I began to empathize with her, it was a reminder of what she was longing for. And so all of a sudden, I become magnified in her mind and in her heart in a way that I had never become before because now there was a vulnerability in her relationship which opened her up to me in a way that she's never opened up before. So now she begins finding an attraction for me based upon the hurt that she was experiencing that she never had before. And so as I began to speak life into her, her husband at the time became worsened, became Satan incarnate in her eyes, and I became angelic. And so this unnatural attraction was developed because I began to communicate with her and meet an emotional need that her husband was not meeting. So when you become a listening ear and a sympathetic ear, so the problems of another person who's involved in their relationship, you're doing them more of a disservice than good. So the advice should always be to seek out somebody of the same sex, same gender, or to seek out professional help. Sign number four, you anticipate seeing your friend more than your spouse. Now it's quite interesting. When a couple has been in a relationship for quite some time, they transition from being soulmates to role mates to roommates. They often spend a lot of time together in the initial phases of the relationship, and then over the course of time, it begins to drift away. In fact, even within the same household, while we participate in what we call physical proximity, where we're in the same room, watching TV, or engaged in a conversation, over the course of time, the wife goes in, uh, into the living room watching television, the husband winds up in the office on the computer, and even though they're in the same household, they don't spend any time together. And quality conversation is limited. In fact, according to statistics, the average couple only spends five minutes a day communicating. And that's often done uh, early in the morning on their way off to work, or when they come home from an exhaustive day at work and they're just dealing with the surface issues of life. However, when you have an opposite sex friend, when it's gone from platonic to problematic, you anticipate seeing that person. Now think about it. If you spend eight to nine hours to 10 hours a day on your job, you're developing relationships because you're spending hours and hours and hours communicating, developing what we would call intellectual intimacy with other people. And so you have stronger, more sincere, uh, more intentional relationships outside your home than you do within the confines of your home. And that can often happen when you have an opposite sex friend. You're anticipating physical 
proximity. You're anticipating quality time. And when you seek that more than you seek time with your own partner, that's when you know that you're truly in trouble. Sign number five, you begin comparing your spouse to your friend. Danger zone. Whenever you're in the uh, situation where you're now looking at a friend and identifying things that your friend has that your spouse no longer has, you begin to develop an unconscious attraction for your friend. You begin to seek out things in your friend that you feel like you're not getting in your own relationship with your spouse. So it's a definite no-no. Sign number six, you show more concern about your friend than your spouse. I see this all the time. A friend gets sick, a friend is in need, a friend runs into a situation, and what we do is we race uh, to our friend to accommodate them however we can because of a need and of a passion to serve them in a way that we don't even serve our spouses. So when you begin to uh, pay more attention to the welfare of a friend than your own spouse, when you race across town to go out of your way to accommodate a friend but won't lift a finger in your own home when dealing with your spouse, that's a sign that that is a close call friendship. Sign number seven, you provide special treats for your friend. Now this is a danger zone. When you begin to communicate long enough with a friend, you begin to learn what they like. You learn their hobbies, their interests, their passions, what food they like, what they like to drink for coffee. And so what happens is, you know, on your journey to work or church or any type of social organization where you know you're going to see your friend, you think about them along the way and you pick up a little treat. You pick up something, you know, a little small, just, just as a way of appreciating your friend. And here you go, you go with your cup of coffee or your bag of chips or, you know, or the brownie that you know they like. And hey, I was just thinking about you. This is for you. And it becomes an expression of appreciation that you have for your friend. But what we do not realize is that according to the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, gift giving is a love language. And so for some people, receiving gifts, receiving treats means everything. It's not about how much you spend. It's not about whether something is a name brand or not. It's not about any of those things. A gift represents you were thinking about me. You took the time to go out of your way and to bless me or to meet a need in me that you know would make me feel good. And when you do that, what you're really doing is you're crossing a line because the same effort and intention that you would have in getting things for a friend should be spent getting things for your partner. When was the last time that you gave your partner some flowers? When was the last time that you bought your partner a card? When was the last time that you bought your partner a gift just because? So if you find yourself naturally doing that for a friend and not your own spouse, that's a sign that you're in the danger zone. Sign number eight, you fantasize about marriage with your friend. Now, if you're at the point where you're fantasizing what a relationship or marriage would be like with your friend, then you've also fantasized of what life would be like without your current spouse, because you've gotten to the point where you're just sick and tired of being tired. And oftentimes before people physically leave, they leave emotionally. Many people are left years ago, though they're physically still in a relationship. Um, and so if you're fantasizing about what life would be like, what marriage would be like, what living in the same household would be like with your friend, this is what we will call an emotional affair. Sign number nine, you spend more time alone with this friend than your spouse. Now this is very, very similar to one that we mentioned earlier, because as we've stated, most couples only spend five minutes communicating. And even if they're in the same household, they drift off into different corners of the house. So technically they're not together. But if you met your friend at work or at church or any social group where you typically frequent once or more a week, it's very likely that you'll naturally spend more time okay, with your friend than with your spouse. And so if you have a desire to do that, or if you're actually doing that, that is a close call friendship. Sign number 10, your spouse does not have access to all of your conversations, whether it be cell phones, text messages, or social media. This is a major problem. You know, there is a 15 page report that I have that you can download in this course that speaks to what the proper etiquette regarding social media should be when you are in a committed monogamous relationship. Because what happens is oftentimes we live very private lives by cutting off, blocking off all forms of communication that we have with the outside world 
from our partners. So our cell phones, our padlocks, password protected, our emails, our social media accounts, and it's very easy to develop emotional affairs that can wind up becoming physical and sexual when you begin to have free conversations that your partner's not privy to. So this represents an element of secrecy within the relationship. And even though it may be wrong in your mind initially, the more you engage in that type of activity, the more you begin to rationalize and justify what it is that you do. And so it gets to the point where now you're going out of your way to keep a secret and you're very crafty and you're very careful about every step you take so now you're chatting right but you're deleting chats you're deleting texts you're deleting voicemails you're trying to get rid of all types of evidence of what you're doing and so if you are in a relationship where you don't have access to your partner's forms of communication and your partner doesn't have access full access to all forms of your communication then that is a problem that can wind up becoming a major issue later on in that relationship. So the advice that I always give couples is share access. 100%. Now, it's not an opportunity for your partner to stalk you or to always be in your accounts because they don't trust you, but it's a sign of I don't know, trust building. It's to say, listen, you have nothing at all to worry about. If you need access, boom, there you go. That is the sign of a healthy relationship. Number 11, you spend money on your friend without your spouse's knowledge. Now, depending upon how your accounts are set up, either A, you share accounts with your partner, or B, you have separate accounts, which means that you really have the freedom to do your own thing. So when it comes to spending money on a friend, this is an example of what we would call uh, financial infidelity, where you're keeping secrets and you're doing things that are inappropriate, which would be considered a form of betrayal. And so we see this happen all the time, where you have a friend who uh, runs into a situation and they're in crisis, a bill needs to be paid, or the car broke down, or a utility is about to be cut off and they need $300 because of an emergency and you're the only one that they can count on and they're trying to convince you to let them borrow the money and now you know that if you take this money out, this is going to be problems because if your partner finds out it's going to be a problem so you're rat you're, you're battling back and forth as to what you should do and the only way that you're going to do it is that they promise to have it back at the exact time you know when payday hits so that your spouse never sees anything and so what happens and so you give the money you get it back and it's in the account no harm no loss nobody knows anything that's the first rationalization but then one incident turns into two and then two turns into 10. And now you're in a mode of operation, right? Which is continuous and it causes a vulnerability not only in your finances, but in your marriage because you're breaching trust. It is an act of betrayal. It is financial infidelity. So it goes from borrowing money or lending money to now purchasing things that obviously cost money. And now you're making a financial investment in a close call relationship, taking money and resources out of the home, giving them to someone else that your partner is not privy to. That is a major, major problem. And so if you share accounts, the secret is, well, I'll just do an ATM withdrawal. So there is no evidence of what I'm spending the money on. And I can justify uh, to my wife what I spent it on because there's no way it can be proven anyway. When you begin to do things like this, this is a sign that that relationship is too close and most likely you're on the verge, if not in a full fledged affair. So the rule should be never, ever, ever spend money on a friend without first discussing it with your partner or having some understanding of what the rules are when it comes to lending money or spending money on anyone outside of the household. Sign number 12. You begin having conflicts with your spouse over this friendship. Now this is very common in a relationship. It doesn't always have to be limited to marriage, but any long-term, mutually beneficial, long-lasting, committed, monogamous relationship, there's gonna be uh, issues that one partner has with another partner's friend. Because there's always that one friend, you know that friend that, you know, it's just a little bit too friendly, the way that they look at your spouse, the way that they talk with your spouse. There seems to be some chemistry. And when you ask about the nature of that relationship, oh, we were, we're just friends. Or yeah, you know, we used to, 
we used to date back in the day, but that was years ago. Or we're all childhood friends. We grew up together, but there's just something about that connection or interaction that you just don't trust. And it becomes a source of contention in your relationship. And your, and your partner is defending the relationship tooth and nail, trying to hold on to that friendship for dear life. If there's any type of outside opposite sex friendship that's causing major vulnerabilities in your relationship, it is a sign that there is a close call friendship that exists and either your partner's doing something inappropriate or that friend may be doing something that's inappropriate. So it does bear having a, a, a legitimate in-depth conversation about defining what a friend is, what is appropriate, what are the behaviors that should be conducted so it doesn't become a major violation. Sign number 13, you lie to spend more time with this friend. Oftentimes in a relationship, we will say, you know what, I gotta go on early to work today. Or you know what, I'm working late. Or yeah, I gotta serve in the ministry and I have to be there Thursday night at eight o'clock. And all of these are cover-ups, right? Uh, aliases for the fact that you're going to spend quality time with a friend. And if you have to lie in order to get together with this opposite sex friend, there's probably an affair going on. And if you've discovered that in your partner in terms of their behavior, it's really something to be concerned about and time to have more in-depth conversations. Because if they can lie about that, the question is what else is being lied about in your marriage? Sign number 14, you hide interactions with your friend from your spouse. Now let's talk about a scenario when you're all in the same place together. You go to a movie with your spouse and your friend is there. You're at church and the friend is there. You're at a social setting and somehow that friend popped up. So you avoid your friend, you avoid the interaction for fear that your partner may identify some type of chemistry, some glance, some conversation, some nonverbal form of communication that would obviously be a dead giveaway. And if you're doing that, that's a sign that you're in a close call friendship. So if you're identifying that in your spouse, it's time to consider the fact that there may be inappropriate behaviors that have become a vulnerability to the relationship. Sign number 15. You accuse your spouse of being jealous when he or she brings up the friend. Now, once again, if there's a point of contention, if you're arguing about this friendship and you're accused of being jealous, nine times out of 10, something's being hidden and it's a sign that it's a problematic relationship. Sign number 16, you develop special rituals with your friend, which you both highly anticipate. So if every single morning before going into work, you meet at the food truck at, at 8.30 in the morning because that's your opportunity to get together because that represents your time. Or if you're always doing lunch together or spending a few minutes at the water cooler or you make sure that on your way home from work every single day at 4.45, you pick up the phone and your friend is on the other end. These are rituals. These are things that you're doing consistently. They don't require a heads up. It's just the golden rule. It's the unwritten rule that you're going to connect in some way, whether verbally or physically, to spend time with your friend. If you're doing that, it's a dangerous position to be in because the rituals that you should have should be with your partner, not a friend. Sign number 17. Your friend shares feelings or touches you and you inwardly respond. When it comes to communication and you enter into the deeper levels of intimacy, where you begin to share your heart, your feelings, your emotions, your desires, that is a soul connection that you establish with someone. This is uh, the beginnings of what we would consider emotional entanglement. And when you become emotionally entangled with someone and have an emotional connection with an opposite sex friend in a way that you do not have with your partner, it's a problem. If that friend can touch you and all of a sudden you get the shivers, there's an inner quiver that you have. It's a sign that there's a high physical, emotional, and sexual desire that you cannot shake. That's a sign that it's a close call friendship. And if you've witnessed that or experienced that with your partner and their opposite sex friend, there's something very dangerous going on that needs to be discussed. Sign number 18. Sexual content becomes a part of your conversations. Now this is majorly problematic. So I don't care if you are sharing a sexual joke. 
I don't care if you're talking about a television show, a reality show, a movie, and you're referencing something sexual about someone else that has nothing to do with your friend. The fact that you're even having conversations of that nature, over the course of time, it will develop where you begin to share what you would do if you could do, but why you can't do because you're married. And when you begin to talk about sex, with a friend, what you're doing is you're stirring up a passion. You're stirring up intensity, sexual energy within you that at some point has to be released and possibly fulfilled. And so you've crossed over a line that you can never get back from. Because if you begin talking about sexual things, if you begin sexting each other and sharing your body parts, you've reached a point of no return. And so now you have this instant connection with an opposite sex friend that you no longer have with your partner. And so even when you begin to share your true feelings for that friend, see when two people begin to acknowledge the attraction that they have, whether physical, the intimacy or the interest that they have, which is emotional, then at some point, the nature of that relationship uh, progresses and it becomes one that is involved deeply in an affair. And so if you have that, you're in trouble. Sign number 19, you do corporate dating. So oftentimes we tell our partners, listen, I gotta go to a business conference, I'm going on a business trip, uh, I'm going to a church convention, I'm going to this meeting, I'm going to this you know, uh, service. And so we use outside attachments, other responsibilities that we have, extracurricular activities, uh, commitments of our membership as a way to hide the fact that, you know what, we're really gonna spend quality time with a friend. Now, in this case, we're not lying because we actually are involved in those activities, but we also know that our friend is gonna be there. So it's a way to secretly reconnect with a friend. Now, what we have just covered are the 19 signs of a close call friendship. If you and your partner have experienced any of these 19 signs, it is an indication that you need to set the proper boundaries and borders in your relationship. The reason why platonic relationships become problematic, the reason why infidelity creeps up in a relationship is because when we started the relationship, we did not have a conversation about what would be considered appropriate or not, or we fought about it constantly when we've identified it, but we set no clear rules, if you will, in place. And so this is an opportunity for you to begin to establish government in your home and have clearly working operational definitions of what a healthy relationship is and what the nature of that relationship is as long as you are in a committed monogamous relationship with your partner. So once again, if your marriage is your primary relationship, every other relationship becomes secondary to that. Now, if there is an issue with a friend that you've identified that you're not comfortable that you know with your partner having, then this is a conversation about the possibility of disconnecting and disassociating yourself altogether with that friend. For nothing would be worth putting your marriage in an uncomfortable, vulnerable position just to hold on to a friendship. So I know that there are different schools of thought. Some are okay with friends, and if you're okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Some believe that these inappropriate relationships are a violation to the relationship, and there is no room for friends. My thing is this, if you're gonna have a friend, okay, then that's gonna be my friend too. <laughs> so if my wife has a friend, her male friend better be my friend. I better have a relationship with him. I've got to be able to communicate with him. I've got to be able to get on the phone with him when he calls the house or if my wife calls him. If not, inappropriate, it's got to be cut off. If I have the type of friendship with an opposite sex friend, the same way I had before I said I do, and now I can get together and you know my friend texts me in the middle of me watching a movie with my wife and I'm texting and I'm giggling as I'm sitting over here watching a movie with my wife, that's inappropriate. If I say, hey babe, I'm going out with my friend. Who? Oh, Clara, uh, Hafiza. Oh, go ahead babe. That would be insane. So I'm gonna leave my household and connect with a friend, go to the movies, and have a good time, that's something that I should be doing with my spouse. And as ridiculous as that sounds, you'd be surprised how many couples never have this conversation and wind up getting into situations because these things have not been clarified. So this is where having negotiation 
about what is considered healthy relationships comes into play in your marriage. If you are serious about establishing a healthy relationship within the confines of your marriage, take the time to review the 19 signs of a close call friendship in whichever signs you identify in your marriage, turn those signs into rules that you can use to properly govern and protect your marriage.